as with most of the world, or all the world actually, until fairly recently here, farming was the dominant economic activity of the colonies. Um, let's take a look at the southern economy first. Uh, the Chesapeake, from 1640 on, uh, had an, uh, basically produced too much tobacco, and this created rises, uh, uh, prices that rose and fell dramatically. And so there were times when everything was going great and everybody was making tremendous money, and then there were times when the price of tobacco fell so low, uh, people couldn't feed themselves. And this was just the way of life in the Chesapeake, this boom and bust cycle. South Carolina and Georgia, as you can see on our map here, uh, relied more on rice than tobacco. Well, rice was actually hard to grow and it was kind of dangerous to grow. And it was such back-breaking, horrible labor uh, that whites refused to grow rice. Whites refused to work the rice fields. And so this is why South Carolina and Georgia ended up with even a higher percentage of slaves than places like Virginia and Maryland. The development of these cash crops, where somebody could get quite wealthy just simply by farming these uh, expensive crops, prevented the South from developing industry. They didn't really make stuff. They didn't have factories and things like that because they didn't need them because they could make such good money with the cash crops. And they didn't really develop any sort of business uh, uh, organization. There weren't really banks or anything because London merchants would sail over here and buy the stuff from them and take it back to England for them. And so the South really didn't develop any industry or any financial industry, which is going to be a huge problem for them uh, in the future because all they're really capable of doing is growing crops. Now, New England is much different. They, they don't have the weather to grow cash crops. Um, the, the climate is cooler. The soil is rockier. Um, the, mid, the, the middle colonies do have a fertile soil, um, but it's not the kind of uh, temperature that's going to grow things like tobacco and rice. So instead, they grow wheat and corn and things like this. They just don't fetch a huge, you can make a living doing it, but they don't make a lot of money. But this is really a blessing in disguise for two reasons. One, there's not a, a, a significant use of slave labor because growing wheat and corn is a lot easier than growing tobacco and rice. Uh, but also, the middle Atlantic colonies and the New England colonies will develop industry. Um, virtually everybody in New England uh, or the middle Atlantic colonies had some sort of industry they did in their house. You see here a farmer working uh, a loom. They would create something in their house and then sell it to everybody else. It could be clothes, it could be soap, it could be uh, butter. Um, and so uh, there was, for right from the beginning, this real emphasis on making things, not just growing crops. Um, they also had an artisan class as well, people, uh, skilled people who made things uh, the other people in the colonies needed. Cobblers who make shoes, blacksmiths, rifle makers, cabinet makers, silversmiths, printers. These were all available in, in, the, in the middle and in northern colonies. They also began to put water wheel, wheels on rivers and streams to power mills, and they had lots of uh, looms, mills to crush grain, of course, and lumber mills in this part of the colonies. And in fact, New England will develop large-scale shipbuilding um, uh, up in the north. Saugus, Massachusetts will have the first ironworks in the colonies. That's actually it there. That's a picture of it. Um, where they were able to forge things made out of iron, which is a big deal. It ran from 1646 to until it closed in 1668. Uh, despite its failure, other metalworks would open, and uh, the U.S. would have some fledgling, some uh, small level of industry. Um, of course, this was restricted uh, because there weren't a whole lot of people to sell it to. They couldn't sell it back in England, really, and there weren't a whole lot of people in the colonies to sell it to. And they also didn't have much of a labor force here to work in these places, and transportation was a problem. There weren't good roads around the colonies, so even if you made something, getting it to market was an issue. Eventually, England, fearing that colonial comp com uh, uh, industry will compete with English industry, will pass laws limiting um, the size of American industry because they don't want competition. But over time, lumber, mining, and fishing will replace the fur trade, and uh, uh, the northern colony's most valuable uh, purpose will be supplying raw materials, things like lumber, that will then be uh, manufactured in England and sold back to the colonies. The colonists were poor. About half of, of colonists had no plow. Uh, half of farmers, excuse me, had no plow. Many had no kitchenware, no kitchen utensils at all. Only about half had guns, and rifles were important for hunting. But only about half had those. Few had things like candles or wagons. Most of them had an axe, though. That was something most people had. They weren't really subsistence farmers um, because they couldn't really take care of themselves because most didn't have access to a loom or a mill to grind their grain. Uh, we were actually poorer than subsistence farmers. The colonies were an extraordinarily poor backwater of the British Empire. I shouldn't be on this uh, 
No, the, oh yeah, no, I meant to be here. All right. And so you see here the, the, the trade. So here we are. Notice we're sending raw materials back to England, and they are manufacturing them and then sending them back to us. And so uh, we're the mine. We're the, the lumber yard. But we don't really make much that gets sold anywhere else in the world. If we make something, it tends to be sold here in the United States. The colonists don't have money. They don't have gold and silver. Our paper money we print is basically worthless. Nobody wants it. And so the colonial economy was primarily a barter economy uh, where we would trade things like furs or corn or wheat uh, with each other uh, because we, we didn't have any hard money, uh, meaning precious metals. There was a vicious competition uh, between uh, both uh, uh, farmers and merchants. And there was no understanding of supply and demand. So anytime uh, there was something you could sell and make good money on, the market would be flooded so quickly, the price would fall to the point where nobody could support themselves. To the Caribbean, we sold rum, um, agricultural goods, you know, crops, uh, meat and fish. And from the Caribbean, we got sugar, molasses, and slaves, of course. Um, it wasn't really a triangular trade. We call it that, but it flowed in all directions. Um, it wasn't a triangle where you just walked around and order each each angle. It was really three points trading with each other, but uh, any of these partners can trade with each other in any direction. Eventually, England passed the Navigation Acts because they want to keep foreign competitors out of what they see as their profit centers, the, the new world. And so they made it illegal, uh, as I mentioned before, for foreign ships to trade with America, uh, the Caribbean or America for that matter. Um, and, of course, many Americans would then re resort to smuggling, uh, and that became a huge issue in the colonies. As America slowly became richer and richer, we developed a sense of consumerism. That means buying stuff uh, just to have it. There's also an increasing gap between the wealthy and the poor, and the rich would turn to conspicuous consumption. That's where you buy something to impress other people. If you're, if you're buying clothes because you want everybody to notice how nice a dresser you are, or if you're buying a, a fancy car, that's called conspicuous consumption. You're, you're buying something to show off. And that became a big deal among the wealthy in America. The Industrial Revolution in Europe had made consumer products far more available. There's just a lot more things like shirts and wigs and cups and things like that. And, of course, they see America as a great market, and so uh, advertisements for these new manufactured goods began showing up in America. Merchants' agents will go around to wealthy landowners in America with catalogs and sell them all this stuff. Uh, both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were obsessed with having the absolute latest, most expensive fad uh, from Europe. Jefferson spent himself in a bankruptcy doing this. Luxuries would become necessities. Things that nobody had ever needed before will one day become things we can't live without. I remember when cable was a great luxury, and now, of course, who could live without cable or the Internet? Back then, we're talking about things like tea, linens, glassware, cutlery, crockery, that means pots, furniture. You begin to develop this idea of gentlemen and ladies, uh, and these are people who could afford the luxuries of life. That's kind of what that means. Um, education becomes a big deal. Be having Being well-read, owning books, having magazines around uh, becomes a way to impress people and says a lot about you. And manners. This is where we really get this formal idea of manners, opening doors for ladies, uh, things like that really develops in this period. Other things that the rich uh, American landowner can't be found without would be libraries, portraits of themselves and their families, formal gardens, um, elaborate wardrobes, and of course these hairstyles which will ultimately evolve into these, uh, in, into these powdered wigs that we're all familiar with. Um, that's a little bit about uh, the economy of colonial America.